Uh, if you want a good quality clothing, you're going to get it from India. They're like one number one producer of textiles. But there's going to be a change that's going to happen because in the 19th century, Great Britain takes over the lead. And there's a reason for that. Like if you look at the picture, there's like two images. Who's on the bottom left hand corner of that image? That's Gandhi. What's he doing? He's making like clothing, right? And he has a spinning wheel. So he's like plugging away. He's like doing it by hand. He's like making one thread at a time. And on the upper right hand corner, that's in England. And you have this girl and she's standing by these machines. And you know what those machines are going to be making? The same thing Gandhi's doing, but like in like half an hour. You know, like what Gandhi's going to be laboring to make clothing by hand. This girl's going to be running not just like one machine, but like however many 20 machines she's in charge of and every once in a while the machines will jam and like she has to clear the jam and that's fine though because she'll just like you know like stick her hand in there clear the jam which one of those is going to make it cheaper for a shirt yeah like england for sure right in the 19th century britain took the lead in textile production due to you'll write down the industrial revolution if i can make it faster then i can also make it cheaper so as a result, on the third line, or on, yeah, the third line, due to mass production, textiles became very cheap, and this put skilled Indian artisans out of work. Like, hey, I totally respect you in India. I think that's awesome. You can make clothing, like, by hand, like, from scratch, but I'm just going to go with, like, the cheaper, faster version because of the Industrial Revolution. So we have Indian laborers who were, like, really good at what they did now out of work. And by the end of the 19th century, India was only supplying, you'll write down, raw cotton, raw cotton. That means like they didn't process it. That meant that they didn't do any. It was just like we grow it in India and we send it to England. And we have to grow it in, in, England, in India because it's too cold to grow it in Europe. You can't grow cotton meaningfully in, in Europe. And so now Great Britain began selling finished cotton, you'll write down, back to India. They began selling finished cotton back to India. So it's just like a reversal. We used to, England would argue, we used to buy our clothing from uh, our clothing from India, but now we're selling it to India. This on your handout became a source of wealth. So they're now selling Indians the clothing that they once bought from India. And even though cotton is a source of wealth in the 1800s it's nothing compared to another thing that the british are making sure that they grow and the british are making sure that they sell even more wealth comes from what other crop opium from poppies which is on the slide so this is a poppy flower on the left and on the right this is a poppy field in afghanistan today because today afghanistan's the world leading producer of opium and this is where we get like our heroin derivatives from. A lot of it comes from Afghanistan. It's like the number one export of Afghanistan, sadly. It's illegal, but there's some money to be made. And it says on the handout that this drug was highly addictive and it was grown in India. So the British are growing it in India, but they're not selling it to India. Who are the British selling it to? Yeah, we'll write down it's sold to China. And we've talked about this already. So that's. That's a review. The rise of economic imperialism. In the 1800s, global power began to move away from Asia. Forever and a half, Asia was like the richest. Asia was the most powerful. It, when Marco Polo went to Asia, he was describing it. People were like, I cannot believe it's so advanced. It's like ridiculously modern. Like they bathe more than like twice a week in Asia. Like you're making it up, Marco Polo. Like that's how Asia was. It was like number one. And power began to move, you'll write down, to the industrialized world. Because most of Asia didn't industrialize, they're kind of losing their advantage. In fact, you should all know, you should all remember, what's the one Asian country that, that did industrialize in the 1800s? Japan. Japan. Like, they got it. During the Meiji Restoration, they understood, yeah, we need to, like, modernize because those who don't get, like, beat up. And it says in the handout that leaders in the Industrial Revolution included Great Britain. Yeah, they started it. The U.S., they were a leader as well. But also two countries, two kind of like new kids on the block. One is a non-white country. You've already mentioned it. You should write down what, which one? 
Japan. And then there's one new European country. This country literally didn't even exist in the 1870s. But thankfully, nationalism brought them together. And to this day, they're actually the richest European country in 2022, Germany. Germany. In fact, Germany has like car companies, BMW being one of them, Volkswagen. You know, they still are making manufactured goods. And Germany is today the richest country in all of Europe. So good for them. They got it. And plus, Japan and Germany, they're new on the list. Later, they're going to become best friends and they're going to fight together during a uh, during a. Uh, World War II. So them being on this list together, they're going to stay on this list for other reasons as we progress to the 20th century. It says on the handout that economic imperialism is when foreign businesses have great influence in other countries, when they have great influence in other countries. So economic imperialism, I may not like beat you up physically, but I can like bully you like with what I can sell to you and what you have to buy and how much I'm going to charge you. That's called economic imperialism. When foreign business interests have great influence in other countries. And it says businesses wanted to extend their influence across borders. I don't want my co company just to be like powerful in my country. I want it to I want to cross borders with my influence. So how do white people get into Asia? Well, we have to go back a little bit. We have to actually go back to 1588. And it says on the handout, there was a shift in power in Europe after 1588. In fact, we haven't been in the 1500s in a while, but if you were to pick a white country in Europe that was like the number one white country in the 1500s, what single country would you pick because of all the gold and the silver and the empire they had in the 1500s? Who would you pick? Who? It'd be Spain. Like, remember Chris in 1492, the whole, you know, Mexico to South America thing? Up to this point, the leading European power had been Spain. You might remember that because of disease like smallpox, 90% of Native Americans were wiped out. And Spain, they had more gold, they had more silver because of the Aztec and Inca than anyone else on the planet. But what happens when you are flooded with like a lot more money than your economy can handle? What do you go through? We're going through it now, 40 year high. Inflation. You go through inflation. It turns out, dang, that's like a bad thing. During the pandemic, we spent trillions of dollars we printed and oops, we now have 40 year high inflation. A report just actually came out uh, that said we might go through a recession this summer. A recession is like the step before depression. So it turns out printing trillions of dollars and giving everyone free money to stay home may have had a bad effect. Well, Spain also, they have a bad effect. With all this money, they overspent and they engage in expensive wars, and that led to Spain's decline. It led to Spain's decline. So Spain actually started to suffer because they 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 blew through the budget and, and they didn't really have, you know, money left over. And like today, no one thinks, oh, Spain, that's like a great country. It's actually one of the poorest countries in all of Europe. They went from number one to like the bottom of the pile. And before they fell to the bottom of the pile, they had beef with England. In fact, it says in 1588, England is going to successfully defend themselves from invasion. You might remember that England was ruled by a woman who's super duper famous. We actually saw clips of a movie about this woman. You might remember she had a, a half sister who hated her. Her half sister's name was uh, uh, Mary. She had a nickname Bloody Mary. What is this queen of England who made England Protestant called? Queen Elizabeth, right? And because she never married, there's a U.S. state named after her. What state's named after Queen Elizabeth? Virginia, because, you know, she's like a virgin. She never married. So Virginia is named after her. But a lot of people didn't like Queen Elizabeth because they thought, man, how can a woman lead England? Who wants a woman to lead them? Answer nobody, said uh, the King of Spain. So the King of Spain, he thought, you know what? I'm going to invade England. I'm actually going to do them a favor. They're going to thank me because who wants to have a woman in charge? 
So he invaded England, and, and a lot of people thought, man, Queen Elizabeth's a joke. A woman can't lead. A woman can't do it. But actually, Queen Elizabeth did such a great job. She she defended her country, and she defeated, you'll write down, the Spanish Armada. That word armada is A-R-M-A-D-A. -A -A. If you don't know what an armada is, it's like a collection of like Navy, Navy vessels. Like They put together one of the largest fleets in the world, they thought England's gonna fall like a house of cards, but actually the English beat the Spanish. And from this point on, Spain is on the decline and England goes from kind of like a joke country to like one of the most powerful countries on the planet. It says on the next line, as a result, the Asian spice trade was now open to the English and the Dutch. These two countries that are small but the english and the dutch became some of the most powerful countries on planet earth we've talked about both of these countries before briefly in fact it says on the handout you should probably remember this trade was initially led by a corporation and this is the corporation that took over india what were they called british yeah you'll write down led by the british east india company that was this powerful corporation and this corporation was so powerful, they actually took over India. And there's another corporation that you should know by name. It has a funny abbreviation. They're called the VOC. The VOC in Dutch stands for the Dutch East India Company. And they both did business in, you know, uh, East India. The Dutch East India Company. For those of you who are good at geography, the Dutch actually take over part of Asia first indirectly, then directly. And they take over everything in, I don't know if you want to, I guess this is orange. What country is this today? Now, I've had people tell me this is the Bahamas. Wow. I had someone tell me this is Idaho. This is with seriousness. Someone told me this is Australia. And someone said, this is Rio de Janeiro. So... <laughs> What country is this in orange? That's Indonesia. That is Indonesia. You're the only person to get. Actually, no, I took that back. Uh, Mati Sol got this earlier today. But I got I got Florida. Someone said that's Florida. I think Idaho was the worst one. Because like Idaho is like a landlocked state, you know, like in, in the US. So that's Indonesia. Uh, this region is modern day Indonesia. That's I-N-D-O. Uh, how do you spell Indonesia? My spelling is like gone. I-N-D-O-N-E-S-I-A. There you go. Thank you. Indonesia. Yay. Better than the answers I got earlier. So that's not in that that is Indonesian orange. And listen, that's bigger than the Netherlands. Like if you look at this key, this key shows you like every inch is 400 miles. This country is like 2000 miles wide at least. Indonesia, uh, 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 Netherlands is not that big. And so this is like a huge part of the world they take over. Idaho is pretty big, like north to south big. Because it goes to Canada, and I think it goes as far south as, uh, well, it touches Utah. But I think it touches Wyoming also. There's like Some of the borders are kind of weird. It does touch Montana, too. Monta like Idaho is like long, you know, like it's, 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 it's like goes all the way up to Canada. It's a weird chin or something. Yeah, it looks like a vape device to help you guys understand, you know, the just to help people like, you know, have a grasp of what I'm talking about. It says on the handout, um, it was a source of what was called, you write, write down, the Spice Islands. That's what they called this whole area because, you know, there was a time like pepper was like, if you wanted to make money, pepper, because like white Europeans didn't have any spices at all. And so that's why they went wanted to be in Indonesia. And it says on the handout, at first control went from the VOC, which is like the Dutch East India Company, and you'll write down and indirect rule, indirect rule. So it was like a corporation that was like running these islands. So the government of the Netherlands didn't like rule directly, they ruled indirectly by this, by this you know, Dutch corporation, but then it moved from that to, it says in the next line, to the Dutch government taking over directly, taking over directly. So they would eventually, eventually take it over, taking over directly. 
So there's this political cartoon and there's like this woman holding up a necklace. And you know, people have like charms on necklaces and the charms like represent like something special or important, like a birthstone or or something of like no, like a precious, maybe like a jewel or something. Well, this woman's holding up this necklace and there's like these charms, but it's not like a diamond. It's not like a birthstone. It's actually, if you look at what her necklace has, it's Indonesia on her necklace. Like that's what, and so she's representing what country? She's she's the Netherlands, you know? And she's like, oh, I wonder what fancy thing I own. Oh, I own the 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 Indonesian islands. And that's what she's holding up. And so it says on the next line, the Dutch imperial imagery representing the Dutch East Indies, the text of this caption, it reads, our most precious jewel. And so her jewel isn't something like a diamond. Her jewel's not like her birth. So her jewel, the, the Dutch empire's jewel is Indonesia. And listen, the Dutch were terrible to the Indonesian people. And they basically said, okay, you're ruled by us. You're not free anymore. You really got two choices. You can either farm cash crops. A cash crop, if you don't know, a cash crop is something like sugar. A cash crop is something like tobacco. A cash crop is something like palm oil, like palm. Is that something like you can feed your family at the end of the day? No, like you can make money as long as like the market's working, but this is actually just the benefit people in charge of you. So that's one thing you could do. And the second thing you could do, you could work on government farms, we will write down for 66 days a year, 66 days a year. That's not like getting paid. It's like you have to like pay your tax. So it'd be like if, you know, you're telling your parents, hey, I'm really excited, you know, summer's coming up, you know, what are our plans? You know, like we're going to Fiesta, Texas. We're going to go like Colorado. You know, what do we got something going on? And your parents are like, oh, I actually signed you up for a 66-day volunteering at LaPorte High School. You know, like <laughs> that would not be, oh, wait, that's like banned. Never mind. Uh, that would be like a challenge, right? 66 days of unpaid, like, I don't know, like marching in the sun, like on concrete. Who would do that by choice, you know? So that's what happened to, to the people of Indonesia. And this practice eventually it came to an end because like the Dutch kind of realized that, you know what, this is a system that is not going to be able to last. And it says on your handout, this system, eventually it's going to, uh, it's going to come to an end, but it doesn't come to an end until 1870, 1870. Three. That looks like a pyramid of power. And I think like almost every country we've had a pyramid of power. Who's on the top of this pyramid of power? white people are the dutch people are this is the pyramid of power in indonesia and actually interestingly there's a group of non-white people second in charge who's second in charge in indonesia japanese because you know what they did they industrialized like they got it like they are doing well and in the very bottom is like the native people of this country so we'll write down the dutch introduced a caste system we saw a caste system in Latin America. We saw a caste system um, in, you know, obviously in India. And now there's a caste system that the Dutch have put in. And it says in the handout that the Dutch East Indies were ruled by the Dutch and they weren't even like a large percent of the population. How many white people were in Indonesia, like as a percent? We'll write down, they were only 0.4% of the population. So if you went to Indonesia, it was 99.6% non-white. And then you have like the 0.4% white people and they're the ones in charge. And according to my pyramid of power, where are the native Indonesians in their own country? Where are they in society? They're on the bottom. We'll write down native Indonesians were on the bottom of society. This is their own country. And in their own country, they're on the very bottom of society. Well, the Dutch rule Indonesia for 300 years. And um, if someone rules you for 300 years, how, how would you expect to be influenced by someone if they rule you for 300 years? What are cultural things that you'll probably start doing after 300 years of them being in charge of you? Speaking their language, like, did Spain do a good job pushing their language on Cuba 
and Colombia and Argentina. Did Spain do a good job pushing their language there? Yes. Yeah. Did, did England do a good job pushing their language on Jamaica, Kenya, and Nigeria? Yeah, they speak English in Jamaica, in Kenya, in Nigeria. Well, actually, the Dutch don't do so hot here. They don't do a good job pushing their culture. And after 300 years, how many people speak Dutch in Indonesia today? You write down only 2%. Only 2%. So actually, almost, almost nobody does. Indonesia does get their independence from the Dutch, you'll write down, in 1949. That's also something else like really important came to an end in 49. What else came to an end in the ballpark of 49? Like big event globally. World War II, right? And like who's the bad guy in World War II? Germany, right? Like Adolf Hitler, right? And take a wild guess. You don't have to know anything about history to make this guess. Guess what the Nazis, guess what Adolf Hitler did to their little neighbor, the Netherlands, during World War II? They conquered, they invaded it. And like the Dutch were like, can you believe this? Another country came in and invaded us. Can you believe that a stronger country would take over a weaker country and then force our people to like work for them in camps? Like that's wrong, that's outrageous. And after 1949, the Dutch were like, we're finally free. Man, I cannot believe one country would invade another. What did the Dutch do to Indonesia? They invaded it. They took their freedom away, and then you know what the Dutch did to the people of, the net of Indonesia? They made a population, a pyramid of power based on ethnic background. They pretty much did everything the Nazis did, except for like concentration camps. Like they invaded, they took over, they subjugated, and they ranked people by racial hierarchy. But the Dutch had just spent all of World War II saying, hey, we're the victims. Like that puts you in an awkward position in 49. What are you going to have to get rid of after 49 just because you're like a hypocrite if you don't? You're going to have to get rid of your colonies. And they're like, hey, my bad for the last 300 years of imperialism. Like they were upset about Germany and they should for like five years of imperialism. Like, man, Nazi Germany, they were jerks for five years. But the Dutch, they've been doing the exact broad same things, taking over, conquering, pyramid of powers, racial hierarchies for 300 years. So that's like one of the reasons they have to tell uh, Indonesia, hey, you guys are free. Moving away from Indonesia to China. For many years, China had goods in great demand in Britain, like this beverage. What's like the, the Chinese beverage in uh, uh, white people love to drink in Great Britain? Tea. Tea, right? And that's fine. That's That's no problem. But the British are hoping that, you know what, I'll buy stuff from, from you and you will buy stuff from me. But are the Chinese interested in any white European products? What do white people have to bring to the table economically that the Chinese like, sign me up for that? Nothing. There's nothing that they have. And so it says on your handout, this created a trade imbalance, a trade imbalance. Usually, I want to buy stuff from you, and I'm hoping you're going to buy stuff from me. But the problem for Great Britain and the problem for all of Europe, it says on your handout that the Chinese were not interested in any European products. There's not a single thing Europe had except for gold that the Chinese want. They're like, no, nah, I don't really, I don't really, your food is gross. Uh, you know, your products are like low quality. There's literally nothing white Europeans you have that I, I'll take your gold but I don't want to like trade with you. Actually, I don't even want to spend time with you because you guys are kind of like barbarians, uncivilized. You don't even bathe regularly, white Europeans. It says the British have to come up with like a plan, you know, like, man, like if only there was something that like the Chinese just got to have and they found something to make up for these losses. What did the British introduce? They introduced opium, right? And there's this chart and on the handout, and it shows you like how many tons of opium a year. What is the first number on the chart? The very far left, how many tons of opium a year were making it into China originally? 50. Like, I mean, I, I mean, that's something. But it goes all the way from 50 a year to 6,500 tons a year coming into China. And the thing about opium, if you look at this picture, these guys like huddled together. 
you know, these guys are like hooked. Can you imagine men huddled together in a corner to share like a, a, some sort of device that you suck on to like feel good for a few seconds and like try? Can you imagine? like how desperate you'd have to be to like hide away in corners and do that kind of stuff like i can't even can't even imagine that kind of like addiction this drug was highly addicted addictive yeah or addicting thankfully we don't have anything like that in our bathrooms thank god thank god we dodged a cultural bullet So it says in the handout, the Chinese made it illegal, which, you know, you think that's rational. I mean, this drug is destroying society. But Great Britain got super pissed and they're like, I can't believe you're outlawing our drug that's destroying your families. And so there's a fight. And, and this fight, this conflict is called, it's called what? Between China and, and, and Great Britain. It's called the Opium War, right? Because it's a war over, over opium. And this was an easy victory for who? The British, right? Like the British, and you know why? The British have guns, the British modernized, the British like did well. And there's nothing to write on this line, but it's bolded because it's important. This is an example of a failed native. Yeah, yeah, go for it, no worries. Uh, this example of failed native resistance failed native resistance. It didn't work, like they couldn't resist. And it says in the handout that um, this was an example of how easily Western powers could dominate non-industrialized nations. If you have not industrialized, expect to get beat up. If you've not modernized, expect to be beaten. And that's what happened, because like China was, I mean, it's a huge country. It was at one time a powerful country. But sadly, China did not understand the global shift in power in favor of industrialized nations. They didn't get, they didn't understand until it was too late. The countries that do well are the countries that have been industrialized. In case you don't come back this Friday. Uh, it says on the handout, um, they had to try like sign this treaty, treaty called the Treaty of Nanking, and it actually forced China to op uh, to be open up to trade. China didn't want to trade. China didn't want to have people over, but the British say, no, you have to, you like have to let us in. You have to let us like sell you our stuff. And this Treaty of Nanking was like super in favor of like the British. In fact, it says on your handout, we've already talked about this. Britain got to keep this island that's like super important for like a hundred years. What, what did they get to keep? Yeah, we'll write down. They got to keep the island of Hong Kong. Super big deal. In fact, y'all remember when they had to give it back? It was in the 90s. Yeah, we'll write down the British kept it until 1997. And that meant there's part of China that was ruled by the British all the way to 1997. So guess what? A lot of people spoke English because they were British for 100 years. If you and I went to China, uh, to Hong Kong today, and remember, just because like someone takes you over doesn't mean like they speak your language. Like in Indonesia, only 2% of people speak uh, speak. Uh, Dutch, but in Hong Kong today, what percent of people speak English in Hong Kong right now? You write down 51%. Like it is ingrained in their culture. 51% speak English at home. But there's a second conflict between China and Europe, and it was over opium. And it was the same issues, and they wanted to push more opium, and China said no. And there's a second. Second war. And they're like, man, what should, we, what should we call this second war over opium? So we're going to write down this conflict in 1860. It was in the second opium war. That's what that's what they called it in the second opium war. And as a result, all these countries pile in. And if you look at the political cartoon in color on the screen, China 
is been slain. And what mythological creature are they depicted as in this picture? Right. They're a dragon, right? And it wasn't one country that beat them. A collection of countries did. Like, one country beat the Aztecs. That was Spain. One country took over Cuba. That was Spain. So they all, you know, they became colonies. But a bunch countries beat up on China so no one colonized it they all wanted like a piece of it who's the bear on the map yeah, Russia's the bear um, the lion with the red coat is going to be what country if it has a red coat famously British. that's the British where are we on this map because we're there yeah we're like on the back behind the bear uh, this animal in the center that is actually um, Germany uh, we haven't talked about this. This is Austria. The wolf is Italy. And there's one non-white country. Who's the non-white country here? Japan. Japan's here. Uh, they're listed as Japan. They also have a katana sword. So again, Japan makes the list of people who are going to be beating up. Like, again, they're the only ones who modernized. And they're like, hey, sign me up for a piece of the economic benefits of invading other countries. It says on the handout, Japan, France, Germany, Russia, and the U.S. all wanted, you'll write down, a sphere of influence. They all wanted a sphere of influence. They all wanted to be able to, like, force China into these unequal treaties. They thought, you know what, this is, like, what we deserve. They thought this is this is going to be okay. And, like, what's China going to do? You know, China's going to do absolutely nothing about it because China's in a position to do absolutely nothing about it. Okay, we're going to stop right there. I have a uh, homework to give you that will be due Friday at midnight. I missed the line. Thank you.